Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Tonight we're gonna to be talking about one of rock and roll's greatest bands. Now this is a band that has its roots in the 60s and we're gonna discuss that as we go along in tonight's video because that's important. But they really didn't hit their stride till about 1970 or at least as far as the world at large was concerned. Of course, we're talking about Creedence Clearwater Revival and the reason that we're talking about Creedence and why this is such a timely video is because, well, there's a couple of new releases by this wonderful band. One of those releases you can see now on Netflix, a performance, by the way, that was long ago hinted as existing by a lot of true Creedence Clearwater Revival fans. And we're gonna get into that live performance because you know what? That live performance tells us a whole lot about this band. But you know, the film not only has that concert, but bits and pieces of the band's entire history. You really get a good bird's eye view of what this band was all about. Now, one of the things I think that you will enjoy about this film, if you haven't seen it yet, is the ton of interview footage from Tom, Stu, and Doug. There's another release that we're gonna be discussing and they're going to be released in, I believe in tandem, but uh, this release is the album. Now the album has been remastered and remixed by none other than Giles Martin. And of course that's George Martin's son and uh, what better pedigree could you ask for? Now at the beginning of this video, if you recall, I claimed that this band had roots deep into the 60s, and I'll give you an example of what I mean. In 1964, America, and thus the entire world, became aware of the Beatles. But it's right as the world became aware of the Beatles that the band that we would eventually come to know as Creedence Clearwater Revival had already been together for a full five years at that point. At first, just a trio of friends who had put together a band called the Blue Velvets. Later, an older brother of one of those three friends would join the band and become their lead singer, and they would be known for a while as Tom Fogarty and the Blue Velvets. Now, the reason they became known as Tom Fogarty and the Blue Velvets is Tom was really focusing in on a singing career. He needed a backing band. He was the older brother, and they even got four singles out in this iteration of the band. They would eventually change their name to the Gollywogs, and finally, thankfully, they changed their name to Credence Clearwater Revival. Now, there's a couple of reasons why this band it was slow to start. They took a while in the 60s to really catch on. Uh, a couple of name changes, as I mentioned. But uh, you got to remember, this was at a time when America was drafting its young men. And so John Fogarty joined the U.S. Army Reserve with Doug joining the Coast Guard in order to avoid being drafted. So that dissolved the band for a bit of time. And when they got back, out the world had changed it was 1967 and they, they were hanging out in the city San Francisco you got to understand these guys were from El Cerrito right down the street practically and uh, they had noticed how much San Francisco had changed the Haight-Ashbury all of that it was at this point that all of them began to change but especially john fogarty he started focusing on a sound that he wanted to achieve and it's interesting in this film we're talking about folks he talks about his whole songwriting approach because you see so many of their songs were so southern sounding many people errantly would assume this band was a southern rock band or at least something akin to that but you know that whole credence clearwater uh, approach to music that sounds so authentic coming from the cotton fields it was actually john fogarty refocusing and trying to get a sound in a quartet a rock quartet 
Once he had that sound, the guitar, often a tremolo or other special effect to get that swampy sound, he then married up lyrics to match that, with many of the songs coming from his imagination only. Green River being an exception to that rule, that song he wrote about a family vacay spot from his childhood. Now, as I've mentioned before, I grew up in the Bay Area, about 60 miles north of San Francisco, and I hung out in the city more than I probably should have. But you know what? I was aware of this band almost the minute that they had changed their name to Creedence Clearwater and released their first couple of singles. Because in our area, KSAN, the radio station, really focused in on these releases. Other radio stations in the area followed suit pretty soon nationwide, and we had quite an interest in this brand new band. And of course, the first single that I was aware of was the wonderful Suzy Q. With the addition of another single, I Put a Spell on You, interest in this band increased exponentially. All right, so the film we're talking about here was in 1970, right at the time when the Beatles announced their breakup. At this point, we see the Beatles still on the charts because, well, they had only been broken up for weeks at that point. And here we have Led Zeppelin doing their incredible thing. Two albums in one year, Jimmy Page coming along. But in 1970, although Zeppelin was climbing the charts and everything, they still didn't own the planet yet. And the Beatles had pretty much given up their crown. The biggest band, as far as sales go, in 1970, it wasn't the Beatles, it wasn't Led Zeppelin. It was Creedence Clearwater Revival. Now, a lot of you know I'm a major Led Zeppelin fan, and I love the fact that that band put together two albums in a single year and managed to tour at an insane rate. That itself is a miracle. But did you know that with Creedence Clearwater Revival, they put out their first album, their second album, and their third album in one year, and they attained five top 10 singles in that year. They were on fire. Now, of course, everybody's been excited about this release because it's been hinted at since about 1980 as actually existing. Now, I said I'd talk a little bit about uh, this band's performance at the Royal Albert Hall here. Uh, you know, this is a really eye-opening performance. You know, first of all, not a lot of chit-chat and interaction with the crowd. Merely the band kind of tightening up their drums, uh, retuning the bass real quick, uh, waiting for John to switch his effects for the very next song, and then usually him stomping his feet, and they join in. Now here's another thing. Once John starts a song, Watch Doug Clifford. You know, Ringo used to say that when the Beatles performed live, he couldn't hear the others, so he would just watch their butts bounce up and down and keep in time with their butts. Well, here we see that Doug Clifford always maintaining eye contact, not with John the body, but John's lips as he sings, sometimes mouthing those lyrics to himself as he drums. Here we see that John Fogarty is driving the entire rhythm section. But think about this now. The second that John goes into a solo or the band goes into a jam, they all turn in to the center and follow Doug Clifford. Wonderful. And you know what? I think Doug Clifford is a vastly underrated drummer and probably the second most talented member in that band, at least as far as reaching to a genius level. But you know, there are no weak spots in this band. They had a basic sound and every single member rose to the occasion. You know, with Stu originally just being the keyboardist in the band and then changing over to bass guitar, he's not a bad bassist. And of course, Tom is a solid rhythm guitarist. The band wisely balanced and kept those guitar parts very separated, yet for the most part, kept Tom's guitar very basic, not allowing it to trip on 
what was happening with John Fogarty's lead guitar. And talking about John Fogarty's lead guitar, you know, John Fogarty is a, one of the greatest rock virtuoso guitarists of all time. But you know what? Like Neil Young, he has a sound. I think of barbed wire when I think of John Fogarty's lead guitar. And you know, it has that bare sound. This was a man, he was a tone chaser, and it was his tone chasing that not only developed his guitar sound, but it developed the Credence Clearwater revival sound as well. Now here's another thing that was brought up in this film. John Fogarty said that he was especially vague about writing Fortunate Son and Who'll Stop the Rain. He said he didn't want people from different sides of the political or ideological realm to be divided by the message. He wrote it vague enough that each side could embrace it for different reasons. Now, the reason I bring this up, uh, I've made a couple of videos that have been a bit critical of Bruce Springsteen. I'm a big fan of Bruce Springsteen when he's on, and I'm not necessarily a fan of the man. But as an artist, he can't be beat. And personally, I think his greatest album was Born in the USA, an album that both sides of the political aisle equally embraced, and an album that to me, Bruce Springsteen later almost denied in a way. And I can't stand that. Stand by your work, Bruce. And here we hear John Fogarty openly admitting that he didn't mind people making up their own minds. Get it, Bruce? Now, here's another reason why I hate click tracks being used live. In this film, we see the band performing Fortunate Son, and they're gonna lead it up to the next song, Commotion. John drives the band, changing the actual tempo. You can't do that with a click track, folks. And you know what this does? This creates breath. This is living rock and roll, not dominated by some click track that the drummer has to follow and everybody else follows the drummer. I hate that whole approach to new concerts. You know what? This whole performance is as real as the famous rooftop performance by the Beatles on Let It Be or by the Beatles on Get Back if you're a recent fan. They are so authentic. You know, this band played at Woodstock. This band was a monster of a band. So with no pre-show, no dancers, no chit chat, just a basic getting ready in between and playing their damned songs. What did they get? Well, a 15 minute ovation. Amazing. And you know what? In the end, both releases work just fine as they are. You don't have to watch the film if you just want to listen to the album and vice versa is true, of course. But together, especially if you're a fan of Creedence Clearwater Revival, trust me, you want to peruse both of these wonderful artistic statements. All right, so that's it for tonight's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider giving us a thumbs up. That helps the YouTube algorithm better identify the channel to a broader and thus larger audience. And by the way, these names you see in front of me are brand new subscribers. I'm honoring shout outs up to the date of October 28th. That's the date we first put out our first video one year ago. So in honor of us turning one, I'm accepting brand new subscribers and will be giving you each a shout out uh, you may have to wait a while. We're really far behind. And the reason for that is because of the channel's growth, of course. And uh, the job has just become too big. And pretty soon, you're going to have to wait a year before you got your shout out. So I'm going to shut it off after October 28th. But if you subscribe to the tribe by the 28th, eventually you will get your shout out. Now, if you haven't subscribed to the channel as of yet, it is so easy. Just hit that subscribe to the tribe button, hit that top bell for notification, and you'll be notified of all my future videos. All right, so that's it for tonight. I wanna thank you for watching the video. I'm Michael Nolan, this is The Bottom Line. You are the tribe, and I'll see you in my next video.